Good morning. It is good to see y'all this morning. Uh, good to have you here. Uh, we are already here in the, you know, well, we were in December last week, but I mean, here it is, close to the end of the year. We this is the month we celebrate the birth of Christ, and uh, I have in my hand. I'll have them with me at the end of the service back there. Lottie Moon Christmas offering envelopes. Uh, you don't have to put it put it in today, but I'd like you to take one and consider how much uh, the Lord would have you give. The Lottie Moon Christmas offering is a part of the International Mission Board. Every dollar you give goes to four missions. None of it is used for administrative costs or anything else. It goes to missionaries that are serving on the foreign field. We also, you know, we've been doing the first Sunday night of the month. Uh, Suzanne, Suzanne, is she up there? What was it? It's on the, the finance sheet from Wednesday night, which is available out there on the table. But already this, so far, I think we've given how much to each one? Was it three? Yeah, and plus what we have set aside in the budget that's going. So uh, that is to uh, Aaron and Rebecca, uh, Scotty and Jadison, uh, who are serving in Peru. We can disclose their location. The Cancer Society in Waycross and the association. And then this, uh, during this month for Lottie Moon, I uh, ask you to consider giving a gift uh, to this above your tithe, above anything else. Uh, Consider making a Christmas gift uh, for four missions, and so I'll have those with me. Uh, the uh, uh, we had our church conference this past Wednesday night. The sheets are out there on the table on the right hand side. As you go out, you can pick one up if you'd like to um, on your way out day. Plus, I'll have these back there with me. And last week, uh, I handed out some of the Christmas uh, devotionals from Paul David Tripp. I have some on the table back there. There's still some in the box up here. Uh, tonight, we're going to meet here at 6 o'clock. You say, meet here. That's what we normally do, yes. But then we're going to leave from here, and we're going to go to Miss Betty Dennison's, and we're going to sing a couple of Christmas carols and just visit her and encourage her and, and kind of lift her spirits a little bit. Uh, you know, when you go to be a blessing, oftentimes you find you also receive a blessing. So I hope that you'll join us tonight. Uh, we'll go over there, and then when we leave from there, we'll just go back to our homes from there. But uh, that's tonight. We'll meet here. We'll plan to leave at 6, so get here a little bit before. We'll get in our vehicles and head over there uh, to her place and uh, bring a little Christmas cheer to her and lift her spirits a little bit. Is there any other announcements? Anything else? All right. Well, let's open up with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we come here today, and Lord, as we celebrate your birth, Lord, as we'll see in the scripture today, it is the resurrection that is the, the sign, the seal, that everything that you said is true. And Father, I thank you that you raised the Lord Jesus Christ by the power of your Holy Spirit from the tomb bodily, and that, Lord Jesus, you are now seated at the right hand of the Father, where you ever live to make intercession for us. I thank you that we are not saved by good works, but we are saved unto good works, which you prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Father, I pray that you'd help us to be a, a faithful people. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to have a passion, Lord, a burning in our hearts, not only to share the gospel with those that are lost, but, Lord, to love one another fervently, as Scripture commands us to do. Lord, we are to love each other uh, as you have loved us. And Lord, help us to love you with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. May, may we yield ourselves to you. And Lord, in this morning when we sing in worship, may we lift up our voices to you and sing our praises to you, for you alone are worthy. And I thank you for this, and I pray all of this in the strong and mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Good morning. If you are able, let's stand and sing praises to our Lord. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will. 
pray. Lord God, we thank you, Lord, for your blessings of life. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to be in your house today, Lord, to, to worship you, a true and a living God. And Lord, we just pray for those that's been mentioned in our Sunday school class, Lord, the ones that's on our prayer list, Lord, just be with them, Lord. And God, as we take up this offering, Lord, I just pray, God, that it be used for the upbuilding of your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Jesus. 
so glad I learned to trust him. Precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that he is with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. <clears throat> There's within my heart a swept across the broken strings, stirred the slumbering chords again. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Soon he's coming back to the starry sky I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown I shall reign with him on high Jesus 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 sweetest name I know fills my every longing keep me singing as I video that we're going to watch is still to come.
kids make their way out. I want to thank Teresa and Sherry for decorating the church. Appreciate the effort and the work. I don't know if anybody else helped y'all or not. Uh, Jim, you work him like a mule is what he said. No, he ain't said that, Sherry. I said that. Take your Bibles. Let's go to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Ellis James, you not going to tell me bye today? <laughs> All right, John chapter 20, I invite you to stand with me. We're going to read verses 1 through 18. Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths laying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths, clothes lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who came to the tomb first, went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary stood outside by the tomb, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, Teacher. And Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Thank you. You may be seated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we come before your word this morning, I ask that you would speak to us through your word by your spirit, that, Lord, that you would energize our hearts, our minds, our understanding. And, Lord, may we celebrate the fact that Jesus is alive, that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father and that he is interceding for us and that one day that Jesus is coming back. And Father, as we celebrate the birth of Christ, may we also celebrate the resurrection of Christ because that is what makes the birth even more significant. And Lord, I thank you for your resurrection that you came forth out of that tomb and we celebrate that this day in Jesus' name, amen. The resurrection is the linchpin because the virgin birth without the resurrection could not be true. The sinless life of the Lord Jesus Christ without the resurrection of Jesus from the grave bodily would not have been true. The resurrection is every, it just seals everything. It is the proof that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is fully God and fully man, and that he came forth out of that tomb. He is not still buried. Muhammad, is in a, his bones have already rotted away somewhere. And all these other religious leaders, but Jesus came forth out of that tomb. And you want to know something? That ought to excite us. It really ought to excite us. It really ought to energize us because it's not just some figure that we pray to, some symbol, some uh, image of our own imagination. It is the living Lord Jesus Christ that we pray to. It is the living Lord Jesus Christ that we have a relationship 
with. It ought to change the way we think. It ought to change the way we talk. It ought to change the way we live our lives and the way we conduct ourselves. It, everything else needs to fall in line between following Christ. And it really should. And on this text, in this text here, we find the account. Now, you can look in the other gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and you see a few differences. And, you know, you see where it was not just Mary Magdalene, but there were other women with her. And you find uh, where one writer says there was one angel and another says there were two. Don't let those things concern you. Because they're, they're giving different perspectives and focusing in on different points of the resurrection of Christ. Don't get bogged down in the weeds and miss what God is telling us, that Jesus came forth. But, you know, the disciples were not really anticipating the resurrection. Jesus had told them that he was going to rise again. Back in Matthew chapter 20, uh, Jesus had told the disciples there, uh, Matthew chapter 20, verses 17 through 19. Uh, let me get in the right chapter here. Jesus said there, uh, now Jesus going up to Jerusalem took the 12 disciples aside on the road and said to them, this is, they're making, he's making his way to Jerusalem this last week of his life and he pulls him to the side he said behold we are going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be betrayed to the chief priest and to the scribes and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify and the third day he will rise again now, as they stood there and they saw Jesus betrayed by Judas, as they understood Jesus went through a trial of the, the Sanhedrin, the religious council of the leaders of Israel, as he went before Pilate, and as Pilate had sent him to Herod, and Herod sent him back to Pilate, he endured the scourging. When they saw him nailed to the cross, you know, he told them, this is going to happen. And then he says, and the third day, he will rise again. He said in Mark chapter 10, verses 33 uh, to 34, let me just read for you what Jesus said to them there. Mark 10, beginning verse 33, he says, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priest and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him, and the third day he will rise again. So Matthew and Mark record this for us. Jesus, the, the religious leaders, they, they understood this, but in John chapter 2, uh, Beginning in verse 18, we find there were Jesus, the Jews, the religious leaders. So the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show to us since you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple, of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. The people say that the religious leaders didn't believe or didn't understand what Jesus said. Well, if you look what Matthew records for us, uh, in Matthew chapter 27, we find there just before the account of the resurrection, on the day that he was crucified and that he was buried, that in Matthew 27, verse 62, says, On the next day which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. They had heard. They understood he said that he would rise. They didn't understand when he was talking about the temple, but by this point they understood that he, he claimed that he would come back to life. And so they said, therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, he is risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. 
uh, said to them, you have a guard, go your way, make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. See, the religious leaders knew that Jesus said he would rise again. The disciples had heard him say that, but yet they were not really anticipating Jesus to rise from the grave. How do we know that? Because it says on the first day of the week that Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark. And we know that the other gospel writers, that they were going there to anoint the body because Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus had taken Jesus down from the cross, had quickly uh, anointed his body and wrapped it uh, and in preparation, but they went back to finish the job because it was right there at the Sabbath and sundown was close. They had to hurry up and finish. And, you know, Handling a, a dead body, according to Jewish law, you, you, would, you would be unclean. And you would have to go through the ceremonial cleaning. And so Mary went there to anoint his body. She fully expected to find Jesus there. We know from the text that her and the other ladies, they're like, who are we going to get to roll a stone away? The other writers tell us that there was a great earthquake and that the stone rolled back. See, the stone didn't roll away so that Jesus could get out. The stone rolled away so that they could see Jesus was no longer there, that he was already raised. That stone did not hold Jesus in. That stone was opened up to reveal that Jesus was no longer there. See, Jesus would appear to his disciples behind locked doors, that, that grave didn't hold him, could not hold him. And that stone was rolled away. And the angels announced that he's not here, the one whom you are seeking. So Mary had gone there. And when she got there and she found that the tomb was empty, she was shocked. Didn't know what to make of it. And it says she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. That would be John, the apostle John, the author of of this, Jesus is the author, but John is the writer. And she said, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we, don't miss that, because here you just, it says Mary Magdalene, it doesn't list the other women that the other writers li uh, list, but just in her use of the term we, that's plural. And she says, and we do not know where they have laid him, still not understanding that Jesus has risen and is alive. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple who were, were, they were going to the tomb. So they both ran together and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. John gets there, he stoops down, he looks in, but he does not go in. He sees the, the linen cloth there. He sees, you know, Peter, when he goes in, he sees the, the cloth that they wrapped around his head folded up. See, the, the religious leaders didn't steal his body because They'd had a guard place there. They had a Roman contingent to guard the tomb so that his disciples could not come and steal his body away and claim that he had been raised. And they certainly would not have stolen his body to give any credence to that as well. And, and if anybody came in and stole his body, how, do you, how, how many times do you know of a thief that's going to come steal something and leave something neater than when he, the way he found it? See, we, we've been broken into twice in our marriage, once when we were in uh, Valdosta, and once when we were in we were in Albany. When we were in Valdosta, we don't believe they stole anything. The house the, the, or the trailer that we lived in, Josh and Christy were smaller then, and it, we were in the midst of revival services, and the trailer was a mess. It really was. It wasn't a pig pen, but it was just a mess. It was messy, and the detective, we, we when we found out that there had been some break-ins, we, I went down there and I met a, I saw a detective, I stopped and said something to her, and she came by. And Jan, by the, well, Jan got home and found the door open. That's how we found out, wasn't it? She called me. But anyways, when the detective got there, was looking around and said, what well, do you see, notice anything? And Jan just made the comments and said, well, it looks like they, they, they came in. They came in the front door and busted out the back door, uh, which in a single wide is not that far. And Jan said, well, the way the house looked, they probably some, thought somebody had already beat them to it. And they didn't get anything that we know of. Second time, we were not as fortunate. Uh, but I don't know why I told you that. Squirrel. Uh, but, oh, about a thief leaving something neat. Nobody, 
Both times we broke into the first time, we don't think they got anything. They didn't mess anything up because it was already a mess. Second time we were broken into, they flipped our mattress off the bed, had the drawers pulled, dumped out. They didn't put any of the drawers back. They don't take time. That, that cloth around his head, the handkerchief that had been around his head in verse 7, not lying with a linen cloth, but folded together in a place by itself. So they, they didn't really understand, but they were coming to understand. And we will see next week as we finish out, or not necessarily finish the chapter, but we'll see where the disciples come to this realization. Here the focus is on Mary and Peter and John, but they came to understand that Jesus was alive. And the resurrection changes everything. That was the, me- <coughs> Excuse me. That was the message of the early church. In Acts chapter 2, the message that Peter preached there on the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2, verse 22, he says, there are Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves also know, he raised the dead, caused the lame to walk, the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the lepers to be cleansed, fed the multitudes, calmed the storm. He said, you've seen these things. He did it right here in your midst. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. It was God's plan for Jesus to go to the cross. You have taken by lawless hands. He said, you're not without responsibility. While it was God's plan, they still were accountable for what they did. He said, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. He said, God raised him up. This is the message that the disciples preached. He says in Acts chapter 4, when they were called before the council because they had raised the man up, Peter had raised the man up who was lame from birth. And it caused such a disturbance that they called Peter and John in the first time. And Peter said to them, "If, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. See, that would have been the perfect time for them to jump in and say, no, you stole his body. That was the story they told. We found that, you find that in Matthew's account in Matthew chapter 28, that after the resurrection, they told the Roman guards, when the Roman guards came back into town and said, hey, something happened, he's gone. They said, well, here, we're going to give you a large sum of money. And if, it, if Pilate gets word of this, we'll make it good with him. But you just say that his disciples came and stole his body from a group of Roman soldiers. Not likely. Because they weren't looking for him to be raised. They weren't expecting it. They didn't understand it. And yet he was. And Peter now, changed by the the resurrection, says, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. It's because of Jesus and that he came forth out of that tomb. Because if Jesus had not come forth out of that tomb, Peter had had no power to raise anybody up. He'd had no authority. He says it's by Jesus. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It is the name of Jesus. In Acts chapter 13, the apostle Paul says here, in, beginning in verse 30, uh, he was preaching uh, in Pisidia or Perga. And Pamphylia, and it says, but he says in his message, he said, but God raised him from the dead. He was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who were his witnesses to the people. And we declare to you glad tidings that promise which which was made to the fathers. And he goes on. He says, God, that that's the message of Paul. And in the book of Romans. 
chapter 1, just in that opening chapter of the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul says there in verse 4, he says, uh, beginning verse 3, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. The 15th chapter of the book of Romans is the resurrection chapter. And in that, uh, Paul gives us there in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1, I can read through verse 11, but I'll just say this in verses 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, but which also you are saved if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, Peter, and by the twelve. And after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, and by, then by all the apostles. Then last of all he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. If there is no resurrection, then we need to nail the door shut. But if Jesus is raised from the dead, then we need to proclaim it from the rooftops. We need to, we need to tell people that Jesus died for you. And not only did he die for you, he was raised by the power of God and that Jesus is alive. And if Jesus is alive, it's got to change the way we live. No, it, we're not going to be perfect. We're not going to be, uh, you know, we say we're not going to be saints. We are saints according to Scripture. When you are saved, you are referred to as a saint. We need to live up to the, our calling. But the resurrection changes it. And we need to make that known and the disciples began to make that known. But see, at this point, they didn't yet fully grasp that. They didn't fully yet understand that. It says, verse 8, Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise from the dead, even though he had told them that he would. They still were not fully there. But see, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, when I was reading that text, he says here, by which also you are saved. See, that's the question. Are you saved? Not, are you a member of the church? Not, are you enrolled in Sunday school? The question is not, have you been baptized? The question is not, have you always been faithful to church? The question is, are you saved? Are you fully trusting in Jesus this hour? Are you fully trusting in him? Are you saved? That is a biblical term. And so we ask somebody, have you been saved? Saved from what? Saved from your sin. Saved from the penalty of your sin. Saved from the wrath of God that is to come. Are you saved? It makes no difference. I had gone down a church aisle three times and been baptized three times before I ever accepted Christ. I was raised going to church. But I can tell you this, just because you've always gone to church, that doesn't equal salvation. Because that would be a work. Now we should want to go to church. Because Jesus died for the church. Jesus instituted the church. Jesus is head of the church. We ought to be excited that we have the opportunity to come together in worship. And see, Jesus, they didn't understand that he was going to rise. We see the account here with Mary Magdalene there with the angels and then with the Lord and she sees him. See, they didn't really understand that he was going to rise from the dead. And we say, even though they heard him say it, they probably believed it. I mean, when he raised Lazarus and he, talked, he told Martha, he says, Lazarus will live again. She said, well, I know that he'll rise at, at, on the last day in the resurrection. Jesus said, no, this day. Jesus is coming back. And because Jesus is coming back, 
See, in 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter talks about that in the latter days there will be scoffers and those who mock. Say, where is the evidence that's coming? I mean, all things continue just as they always have been. He said, this thing they willfully forget that the heavens that, and the earth that now existed was flooded by water and is reserved by the same word of God that created all of that. Reserved for fire, the day of judgment. Jesus is coming back. And if he comes back today, are you saved? If he comes to call you home, are you saved? Do you know Jesus? I'm not trying to cause doubt. I'm telling you, you need to know. And you can know. John says in 1 John chapter 5, he says, these things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. You can know that you have a relationship with Jesus. It doesn't mean that you've been perfect or that you've been sinless. But we should be sinning less. Seeking to draw near to him. See, Mary, she goes there and angels and she's like they's like why are you weeping well because they've taken away my lord see she, she didn't grasp it just yet she turns around and she sees jesus and she thinks he's a gardener he says why are you weeping who are you seeking she said sir if you've carried him away please tell me where you've laid him and i will take him away and he calls her by name, and the way he called her by name, she knew it was the Lord because she said, Rabbi, Jesus, just as he called Mary by name, he called you by name. And he calls you to follow him, to walk with him, to live for him, to be so enthralled with Jesus. You know, the resurrection, we ought to be, I mean, we really, folks, wake up. We need to, we need to be excited. Last night, we were, yesterday afternoon, we were watching that Georgia football game. In the first half, my heart rate was just normal. I was fully anticipating that they might not win, you know, all this. Second half, though, my heart rate got a little up. It got up to the point my Apple Watch went off and says, detected your heart rate's been over 120 for X amount of minutes. <laughs> you know, like, what's going on? And I'm like, I'm watching the Georgia football game. That's what's going on. And at the end of the game, in overtime, when Trevor Etienne ran into the end zone and Georgia won the game, I yelled, Jan yelled, and so we, we were excited. Her watch went off and said, it looks like you're taking a hard fall. We need to call emergency services, you know. Now, watches were concerned for us, but I'm going to tell you something. As excited as I was about that game, why do we not get that excited about Jesus being alive and Jesus coming back? We need to, I mean, we need to be joyful people. Do we have difficult circumstances? Yes. People say, oh, you just come to Jesus, everything will be okay. Everything may go south in a hurry if you come to Jesus. But I can tell you the difference is you'll be with Jesus. And if you're with Jesus while everything else may go south, it ain't for eternity. It's just for a time. The best is yet to come. The glory is still to come, as that song sang. I want to challenge you. It may be that everyone in this room today is saved. But may it change the way we live when we look at the resurrection. We can, we can look to a baby in a manger, but what we really ought to be looking at is a risen Lord who is seated in the heavens waiting for the Father to say, go get my children. And when that comes, either the day of your death or the day of his return, there is no second chances. And folks, I'm going to tell you something. I've lived 63 years thus far, and too many years have been wasted too much time is gone I can't undo what's in the past but Jesus can change my present and my future I want to challenge you 
live for Christ. And if we will be revived by that knowledge, if we will be renewed by that, it'll make a difference in this church and in our community. What will you do? Would you stand and let's pray? Father, thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for resurrection power that now resides in us. The same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the grave takes up habitation in us the moment we receive Christ. We have Holy Spirit power inside of us. Lord, may we not tamp it down. May we not try to calm it down. But Lord, may we be more excited about you, more in love with you than anyone or anything else. And may we give you praise, glory, and honor. For you are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat>